Speaker, Dr. Ana Maria Anaido Serrano. <laughs> Consultant, Dermatologist, Sultan Kabuz University Hospital. Co-CEO, Medical Director, Sandian Dermatology Cosmetology Laser Center. With 25 years of experience in treating skin of color. Consultant, Dermatologist in Sultan Kabuz University. She has several achievements in her professional life as academician, clinician, researcher, and lecturer at international events. One of her many milestones was to be invited by the late American professor in dermatology, Arthur Paul Kelly, as co-editor of the second edition of Dermatology Textbook on the various diseases, treatments, and cosmetic approaches for patients with skin of color. Former General Secretary of ODS till the year 2011, Dr. Anna Maria continues her busy professional life with other responsibilities such as Educational Supervisor for OMSB Dermatology at SQH, Member of OMSB Educational Committee and in charge of the Simulation Subcommittee. All these are within her numerous responsibilities. With a big round of applause, may I request Dr. Anna Maria Serrano to be on stage, please. A big round of applause for Dr. Anna Maria. Thank you so much. Very beautiful. <laughs> the dais to Dr. Anna Maria Serrano for this symposium. Are we right or wrong? Please, Thank Doctor. You, so, uh, the is recording. Uh, good evening. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking from your busy schedule on a daily basis. Uh, those especially who work in the private sector, uh, we know it's difficult to finish duties by 8.30, 8.45 and being here and it is highly appreciated. From my side, I'm Bioderma team. So, uh, Bioderma asked me to take care of a presentation, and they gave me few options. So I said, either we go for something that is not common, and we are not seeing on a daily basis, or we go for something that looks like very simple, like melasma, but at the same time is becoming a very hot topic, generation after generation of dermatologists years and years from the ancient uh, Roman times till today day. So I have choose to uh, title the presentation, Are We Right or Not? During the presentation, I think that my aim is to take you by hands and show at the end if we agree if we are doing right or not. So for most of you, especially those who are dermatologists, there is not a real secret regarding what is melasma. Regarding what is melasma. But for those who are not, melasma is coming from a Greek word that is called melas, and it means black. It's a condition that is more frequent in ladies, can be seen in gentlemen. Actually, 10% of gentlemen may develop melasma, uh, it is more common during the 30s or 40s, but it doesn't mean that cannot be seen at any age before that. Um, usually, melasma target mainly the epidermis, the extracellular matrix, and the dermis. Uh, 
um, usually present as a macule or patches, could be light brown or dark brown, ash, blue, gray, and it depends of the type of melasma. And the main things or targets or triggering factors of melasma are considered three. What is the UV exposure, the genetic factors, and hormonal. Uh, there are other uh, etiological or triggering factors to be keeping into consideration as anticonceptive pill, endocrine diseases like thyroid problems. Stress has been mentioned usually as, as anything we always most of the times we put stress at the end, but this, it is nothing that has been proved. So regarding the theology and predisposing factors, as already mentioned, uh, regarding UV exposure, no one of us has a single doubt about the strong possibility of UV exposure as one of the main triggerings of melasma. But together with that, we have to understand why UV exposure may trigger melasma. And all of us, we know as well that it is able to generate the oxygen-free radicals and that induce or end in the increased production of melanin. So together with that, there are studies that has been proved, uh, has been proved uh, already that uh, on the areas where melasma happen, it is linked to some genes that are related to the process of melanogenesis. And furthermore, the presence of uh, the vascular endothelial growth factor, which produced, is produced by keratinocytes in response to the UV light. It may promote, uh, promote the growth of the human uh, melanocytes in tissue culture. What about the hormonal factors? It is, again, dilemma, little bit controversial. Nothing has been proved 100%. Opposite to that, there are studies showing that especially in pregnant ladies that develop melasma, is pregnant ladies that they have a high exposure to outdoors activities. On genetics, sometimes, even ourselves, we are sitting in front of the patient in the clinic um, the first question we uh, generate to our patients is, is there any family history of melasma? And the patient just says, oh, my mom, my sister, my brother. So could be. But again, there is nothing proved 100%. But it has been proved that there is some genetic predisposition, especially in patients with dark skin type. Uh, now, uh, regarding the histological classification of melasma, it's not a secret for any one of you that it is mainly classified from epidermal, dermal, and mixed type. Now, when we are going to identify what is epidermal, dermal, and mixed type, there are two ways. Speaking, frankly, because we have dermatology residents here, and it is teaching for them, uh, we have to use the wood slam to say, okay, it is epidermal, dermal, or mixed. But for those dermatologists with a big experience, only on looking at patient skin with melasma, we will be able to say only looking at the type of uh, light or dark brown, ash, blue, gray, we will know that this is a dermal melasma, that melanophage are involved there, and the melanin is deep in the dermis. So there are no secrets for that, but the right way is using Wood's lamp. So I'm not going to repeat again the same words because it's time consuming, but in brief, melasma is classified in two. Either we use a clinical classification of melasma or we use an histological classification of melasma using Wood's lamp. On the clinical classification, we will have mainly three types, either the centrofacial, the malar, and the mandibular. In a study done in the Sultanate, it was done by me as part of uh, my research thesis project in al Nahda Hospital uh, on peeling, a comparative study of, with TCA 35% and glycolic 70%. When we calculate on 
type of melasma and percentage, it comes to be and it correlates with the international incidence and prevalence that the most common one is the malar melasma, followed by the centrofacial and the last, the mandibular. Now, the pathology of melasma, there are thousand things. Since the ancient time, we start saying that it is melanocytes and melanocytes, and problems are only with melanocytes. Today, they, we have go from the stem cells uh, factor study to the neural and vascular component. So, uh, regarding the histological finding of, of melasma, I have already said that there is a problem at the, at the level of the dermal uh, extracellular matrix. There is an issue with the base membrane disruption, increased vascularization, and there are the last topic I'm not going to touch now, we will touch at the end. So, regarding the solar elastosis, that is the problem due to an abnormal increase and in accumulation of elastic tissue. It is a typical part of a photoaging. And that's why today they, the concept of melasma as an acquired hypermelanosis uh, condition is changing little bit into a photoaging condition or disease. So the solar elastosis has been demonstrated in the lesional melasma skin compared to controls or perilational skin of patients. And again, the role of UVB uh, as uh, UVB due, uh, due to irradiation UVB, the keratinocytes will induce the proliferation of different type of cytokines. So things are getting more complicated. Melasma before was only melanocytes, melanosome, melanin. Or we have to use this or that product to inhib the, inhibit the transcription of tyrosinase. Today, they, we are reaching two cytokines. There are a lot of cytokines involved uh, within the pathogenesis of uh, melasma. And um, what about the base membrane disruption? Base membrane disruption uh, has been proved in different studies, as showing on the slides. And uh, it's very characteristic of melasma to see these pendulous melanocytes, how they project, and it is only due to the base, mem base, uh, base membrane disruption. So there are a lot of studies done, a part of cytokines, we have a lot of uh, MMP2, MMP9, what are the matrix metalloproteinase, okay? Uh, what is sure and has been already demonstrated is that the base membrane disruption facilitate the descent of melanocytes, and that's why we are able to explain how in melasma, we have a dermal type of melasma. Because if we don't have a base membrane that is creating channels due to the destruction and allowing the melanocytes and melanin to reach to the dermis, then we are not going to have a dermal type of melasma. So one more thing show up because it is medicine. And melasma from a simple condition is getting complicated and complicated. You know, in uh, Asia, they are very up to date in research, especially what concerns part of cosmetology. And there was a study done in South Korea. It is maybe almost 10 years, 11 years ago, where they managed to prove in 100 South Korean ladies with melasma that tranexamic acid was very effective in treating pigmentation. After that, a group of dermatologists from Brazil, they decided to do mm -mm, almost the same. And they managed also to show. So the questions started, the, um, adding to that, other studies were added where they went into histopathology. So like that, it has been demonstrated that within the melasma lesional scheme, there is an increase in the number of the blood vessels, the 
there is an increase on the size of the blood vessel and there is an increase on the density of the blood vessels. Of course, it's not a secret for any one of us. It is not happening only in Muscat area. It's happening all around the world that when you are sitting in your clinic and a patient with melasma reach to you, more probably, that patient has gone through the all dermatologists in town, in the private and in the government, and that patient has been exposed to a different type of topical medications, to modified clickman formulation with a steroid, and at that point, you will query yourself, is this true, that in plasma, there is an increased vascularization per se as part of a triggering of melasma, or it is a patient that has an increased vascularization due to the abuse or use of topical steroids. But it has been proved. So here there is a query that we answer at the end. I will try to go a little bit fast. On the histopathological clues of melasma as conclusion, there is proof that there is increase of melanin on the epidermal layer, that the base membrane is disrupted, and it facilitates the migration of melanocytes and melanin into the dermis, that there is a protrusion of uh, melanocytes into the dermis, that there is a prominent solar elastosis, and the number of blood vessels, again, as I said, are increasing number, size, and density, it summarizes what I have said. You can see the keratinocytes, the base membrane disruption, allowing the migration of melanin and melanocytes into the dermis, the increase of vascularization, the epidermal pigmentation, and another query that we'll we will touch at the end again. What about therapeutic strategies of melasma? When we approach a patient with melasma, there are four important things to be taken into consideration. Photoprotection, topical therapies, oral medications, and interventional procedures. Now, photoprotection is not a secret for us. Topical therapies, if, if I sit just now to enumerate or put a list of all the topical medications that we have for melasma, the list is going to be huge. So that's why I have decided to choose on the more uh, commonest using topical medications like hydroquinone, retinol, corticosteroid. All of us know that corticosteroid has a non-selective suppression of melanogenesis as well as it has an anti-inflammatory activity the retinoids do it in two pathways. First, the retinoids are able to reduce the oxidation of hydroquinone, and it increases and promotes the action of hydroquinone. And the second thing is it inhibits the transcription of thyrosinase, as hydroquinone does as well. We have the acyalic acid. The good thing with acyalic acid is that acyalic acid does the same job that hydroquinone do, but with one important thing. Acyalic acid is not cytotoxic for melanocytes, what means you can use in a pregnant lady. Kojic acid is a very powerful antioxidant, and again, is an inhibitor of tyrosinase. Flutamide is an antiandrogenic medication that in some studies has been proved to be better or superior than hydroquinone and can be used also in the treatment of acne, hirsutism, and hair loss. What about the combination topical compounds? Here comes a little bit the challenge start when we have the TCT or triple combination therapy that starts, started usually from the times of Clickman and Wills uh, with the a formulation to treat melasma it was tried in the past to start with clobetasol and fails because the side effect. Then he decided to go to betametasone and stop because the side effects. And at the end, with the Willis ad, it becomes to be the formulation of hydroquinone, retinoin, and topical steroid 
mainly on flocinolone acetonide. Now, uh, I put this slide here. This is a presentation I took to um, the Air World Congress of uh, Cosmetology in Cancun in 2012. Um, it was done by me at the university. The only things, again, to say that it was perfect is the amount of patients that I was able to collect because we start with around 18 patients and at the end it finished only on 10 patients. But we, will man we managed to do the cases from the 10 patients, seven patients, what represent almost 70%, got around 75% improvement of melasma. It was called melasma and dermatran C. What means, we gave this name because dermatran C means derma from derma roller, trans from tranexamic acid, and C from vitamin C. How was the protocol formulated? The idea of this study was to target different things on melasma because it is well known that if you try a monotherapy in melasma, you are done. It is not going to work. So when you treat melasma, you have to use a multi-approach. You have to target different things. And that's why with Dermatransi, what we did was, from topical point of view, we were using modified Clickman formulation. The formulation we developed was with a floticasone propionate, retinoids, and dexpantenol. So we have the retinoids, tyrosinase targeting, hydroquinone, tyrosinase targeting. Dexpantenol is provitamin B5. We perform as a soothing agent, but at the same time as a little bit of whitening action. On the esteroids, we know that it has a non-selective uh, melanogenesis suppression. Uh, niacinamide was uh, adding uh, to the patients as a single plain, uh, like a soothing cream, and we use the niacinamide because it inhibits the transfer of melanosomes. And ascorbic acid definitely with the antioxidant action, but ascorbic acid we added as systemic. So we were having clickman, we were having systemic ascorbic acid, so we were targeting, we were targeting the topical, the oral, and the procedural. On procedural, we were doing uh, the application of tranexamic acid with dermapen, and definitely the dermapen creating the micro channels on the skin was able to inject the tranexamic acid. Now, in natural topical compounds, I already mentioned before, the niacinamide, ascorbic acid, and there are, uh, there are a lot of natural compounds, like a veris perennis, that is like a flower, lingin peroxidase, arbutin, soy, lycoris, emblica. Today, present in many products you buy, you will see this cocktail of uh, things that has a whitening action. Camouflage is, again, I'm not going to put a lot of time into that. Now, we are reaching to the third step on treating melasma. Many years ago, it was not in use, but nowadays it's very common. We have the tranexamic acid, we have the glutathione, and we have the polypodium leucotomos. The polypodium leucotomos is that beautiful plant that is provenient originally from South America, but it's a beautiful plant that you can find in many houses as a piece of decoration. Uh, the tranexamic acid and glutathione, the polypom is an antioxidant mainly, and the glutathione also has a powerful antioxidant action. Now, what about glutathione? And here come uh, a recall or request message. Um, glutathione, it, either direct or indirect, it will cause inhibition of tyrosinase. But what worries about glutathione is not how glutathione works or performs. What worries about glutathione is the side effect of glutathione. 
Today day is not a secret, it's not very common in practice in Oman, but we have already the use of glutathione, but it's very common in Asia. This side effect listed here about glutathione has been found mainly on research studies done in Asia, mainly on Philippines, because it's highly in use. It ranges from all the list you can see to thyroid dysfunction, acute renal failure, and lethal complications. So what about tranexamic acid? Tranexamic acid, it is well-known antiplasmine aging. is very common in use to treat coagulopathy. can be used uh, during surgery or post-surgery. Uh, it's being used by hematologists to treat patients with hemophilia or any bleeding disorder. But due to the hypothesis that there is a vascular component on the etiopathogenesis of melasma, it was treated and really it starts to prove, to show that yes, it may help on the treatment of melasma. This is part of the study that was presenting in Cancun. Uh, when it showed that tranexamic acid due to the, uh, uh, this um, uh, prevents the binding of uh, plasminogen to keratinocyte, and in that way decrease the arachidonic acid and prostaglandin, decrease the tyrosinase, and with that decrease the melanin and pigmentation. What about interventional therapies? Here comes another thing. Nowadays, it's very common into practice seeing doctors that they use machines as a first line of treatment for melasma. At the last, of, uh, last time of uh, the presentation, I will mention something about that, but please, this is another call. In any disease we face, it is dermatology, it is pediatric, it is internal medicine, whatever it is, there are first, second, and third line of treatment. And for melasma, within the old literature described, that is knowledgeable and scientifically proved, always the first line of treatment is topical. The second line of treatment is chemical pills. But here comes another challenge for us. We are dealing with the skin of color. We are not Caucasians. Even the doctor sitting there, beautiful one, mashallah, she has very fair skin, but we cannot say that she is Caucasian because we are dealing with the skin of color. Means you have to be careful when it comes to weather. We are living on the GCC area. We run sometimes 50, 52, 53 degrees during summertime. And this is a challenge for us to choose a chemical pill, but again, Till now, it is considered the second line of treatment. After that, it's coming interventional and machines. But again, I repeat, melasma should be treated all together. What means, does it mean that you are going to use only topical? To the topical, you will, you will be adding an interventional or you will add a machine. So, um, on lasers. Uh, when we are choosing the perfect laser to treat melasma. It is a challenge even, even for the most expert people in laser treating pigmentation in the skin, including melasma. There are a lot of research done, there are a lot of reports considering the use of lasers or uh, light therapies like IPL to treat melasma. From the times of Q-switch on treating melasma to the actual times of choosing lasers to treat melasma, with the latest one going to the PICO lasers, okay? Always is a challenge. We reach to the PICO lasers with the PICO Sure and PICO Way without pointing to any company. Uh, we are speaking from the scientific point of view. Still, nowadays it is claimed when we explain to our patients about how the laser is going to help for melasma, 
we say to the patients, no, this PICO is the best because the energy is released like that in only once, doesn't generate any heat, and it targets what needs to target, that is the melanin. But uh, when we go to the real scenario, uh, not everything comes through like that as we want. Still, we have to consider again that we are dealing with the skin of color, and any laser, even the picos, at any stage can induce post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation in our patients. There are combinations of IPLs with uh, lasers. Personal experience, I have seen a lot of patients with melasma when IPL is worsening the melasma. So when you use IPL in a patient with melasma, also you have to be careful. The radio frequency can be used in melasma, but this is another thing. I have seen many patients even coming to the university that they come in that they have been advised to use a derma roller, plain derma roller. I'm not talking about derma roller with some topical whitening agents. Derma roller or escarlate that is non-surgical lifting radio frequency to treat melasma, or many doctors who recommend uh, PRP plasma therapy as a first line of treatment to treat melasma. When you take such decisions, you have to be careful because this type of procedures like microneedlings or radio frequency are procedures that they create channels that help you to deliver what you are applying on the skin. But it doesn't mean that scarla per se will treat melasma or will cure melasma. That is not realistic. The chemical pills I already mentioned as a second line of treatment, there is a huge amount of chemical pills running from the superficial to the mediums and deep pills. Regarding uh, summarized uh, melasma treatment and mechanism of actions are these two tables. Now, I'm not going to repeat this slide because it's what I mentioned before, but it is summarized. Now, uh, in brief, it represents everything what happened during the therapeutics of melasma. We have the sun protection that help in some levels protecting from the UV exposure, and then we have the emollients that take care of the disrupted base membrane. We have the tretionine and energy-based de energy devices that take care of the solar elastosis, and so and so. And there is another wearing mark. From times immemorial, you know, uh, uh, everybody has been tried to treat um, cosmetol, I mean, to treat cosmetic problems, especially on the face, in a way or another. This is a representation of a cosmetics, like a cosmetology, uh, applying cosmetics to a wealthy um, uh, Roman woman. Uh, now, this is the big exclamation mark. We said we start with melanocytes. We went to uh, vascular involvement. From vascular involvement, we have seen that there are a lot of uh, festival of cytokines or pro-inflammatory cytokines involved in the pathogenesis of melasma. But there is one thing that I don't know if any one of you has recalled during the presentation, and it's two words. And this is one of the latest things finds in melasma, and it is mast cells. Now it comes to be that mast cells are increased on the melasma lesional skin. It has been proved that mast cells can increase the pigmentation. And at the end of the day, at the moment, mast cells are comes to be one of the main features of melasma. So it's really to question ourselves how things are getting developed how research are going, 
and where a simple problem like melasma is taking us in a so complicated cascade of events happening within the melasma lesional skin. So it is a representation of the same slide. And this is what we were thinking on the beginning was the main problem of melasma. But today, they, it is with the cross. It is happening, but it is not the only issue. Before finishing, I would like to mention a few points, maybe message to take home. One of them will be, as I mentioned before, that please, every time you have a patient with melasma, take it very seriously. You know, during that a small study done at the University of Dermatran C, those seven patients, if you see on the way the answer, the quality of life questionnaire and the melasma score, you will get shocked. Because most of them, of the seven, they were so happy that the pigmentation cleared to the levels that with cosmetics, it was not showing and nobody was pointing at their face. So you can improve the quality of life, especially for ladies. For us, it's very important. We can have a spot in the forearm or in the leg, but when it touched to the face, oh, goodness gracious, you have to hold yourself because you will keep insisting and using creams, chemical pills, mesotherapy, plasma, laser devices, whenever is there in order to improve that. So always take the case of melasma serious. You have in front of you a lady that maybe the husband is trying to divorce her because we have thousand cases like that for a simple melasma spot or patches on her face. So take it seriously. Second, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, always consider you, your three lines of treatment, first, second, and third. Third, never treat melasma as a monotherapy. Always treat melasma. You know, it's something like if um, you are going to a war and you are really on army active and you are trying to fight with whatever is there in your hands in order to reach to your goal. So melasma is the same. You can never treat melasma with a chemical pill without a sunblock or without a moisturizer or without telling the patient we will do the chemical pills, then you will go into meso whitening sessions and so on and so. The another thing is at the end what melasma is and where we are at the moment, where we are reaching. We reach to mass cells. So, subhanallah, nobody knows. Maybe day after tomorrow, there will be there a research that will come to say that maybe we can use Montelucas to treat melasma. Because Montelucas is inhibiting the, the granulation of the mass cells. So, what about if mass cells are coming increased on the melasma lesional skin? and it is coming to be successful like tranexamic or glutathione to treat melasma. No one of us know. So that's why the question was formulated on the beginning. Are we right or not? To my personal opinion, we are right till today with the knowledge we have about melasma. By tomorrow, maybe another research will show that we were wrong with tranexamic acid, and maybe we have to start targeting mast cells. So this is the aim of my presentation. It's nothing new. It's not a new topic. It's simple, but we believe that it is, I mean, useful for everybody. Because for us, it's still maybe we don't have melasma, but the lady or gentleman sitting in front of us with melasma is taking it very seriously. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah. It was an excellent, a super duper uh, presentation on uh, the pigmentation disorder, especially melasma. Uh, we'll have a few minutes on the questioner sessions. So uh, the question is from the doctors, please, if there is anyone. Hi, good evening. Is 
nice presentation. We appreciate one that uh, presentation. I will ask a question about how long you can uh, continue us for the treatment of the, the time. Um, see, doctor. Um, thank you for the question. It's a good one, by the way, uh, because nobody has a period of time or we are starting, but, but how or when to stop. If we go to things like modified Klickman formulation that all of us, we know it has a steroid, definitely you cannot abuse. Uh, on practice, what at least myself do, is I start the formulation going for three to four months, and then what I'm doing when the patient starts to improve, and I start tapering it. I never stop in only once. I'm going into maybe two wise applications in a week, and then it's the time to push something else that will perform as a steroid sparing agent from the topical point of view, and your patient will be out from Klickman formulation from four to five months. But realistically speaking is what I say. You will get that patient in your clinic today and you will start the process. And the patient will be fine, but patient after four months will disappear and will show in another clinic. And another doctor is going to use again maybe the modified formulation, but never having a steroid for more than four or five months. Hydroquinone, all of us we know that exogenous ochronosis is a side effect of hydroquinone. So you never can abuse of hydroquinone as well. So ideally, what is treatment of melasma with topical medication that include steroids or whitening agents, to my personal experience, never from four, more than four to five months.